Let me get to my notes here. Welcome to Grace Fellowship of Georgetown, Holy Ghost Thursday night. I'm expecting God to speak to us tonight. He's already moving. The presence of God is here tonight strong. There's such a clarity in the spirit that I'm, I'm believing God's going to translate into the word tonight. So turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew. Let's go to Matthew chapter 18. We've been on a series for some time that I want to continue in tonight. That I believe is not just a, a you know, a nice teaching. I believe it's where God's taking the church in these end times. You know, we don't have time to teach every lesson the Bible presents. The Bible presents an infinite number of lessons. We've got to hear God teach exactly what the Spirit of God's highlighting for that moment. A lot of what he's highlighting is the flow the church is going into. What is our assignment? How do we get there? What do we need to change? What toes do we need stepped on? Amen? Because God's got to change us to go into the glory. If we were where we needed to be, we'd already be there. We'd be in it. And uh, we're not to the level we need to be or that God wants to take us. And so he's got to change us. And he changes by the word, right? By the Spirit of God, but it's always going to be in, in, in connection or in combination with the Word of God. Matthew chapter 18, look at verse number 1. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, I'm going to go back to a couple visions and dreams I had here over the past year and a half. And one was in March of 2018. I had a dream. God gave me a dream. He's given me a lot of dreams, but this is one of those God dreams. And, and that I had to get up and write down. And in this dream, the Lord showed me the churches of the world. And he said, these churches are going into the glory. These churches are not. And there were a massive number of churches that he said were going to be excluded from at least being initial experiencers of, of the glory of God. God's bringing the glory. The earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. But there's going to be forerunners of the glory. Now, we've already read in here before, Isaiah 60 says, uh, to, to, we're to arise and shine for our light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon us. Right? And it says, for darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness of people, but his light shall be seen upon thee. Talking about the glory coming on God's people. But then it says, and your sons and daughters shall come from far. That means others will come to the glory once it's initially manifested on some forerunners. And I expect to be a forerunner of the glory. It's my heart's desire to be a forerunner of the glory. Are you following me? And it's my heart's desire that God creates such a hunger in me that I can't help but pursue him to the level I manifest it. It's not enough to believe in it. It's not enough to even desire it. It must be pursued. Amen. You've got a hunger and thirst for it to the level it changes what you do and how you act that you can access it. And there are going to be a whole group of Christians that will be initiators and forerunners of the glory of God. Amen. And it's going to cause sons and daughters to come from far. And I believe there will be churches that will be forerunners in the glory. But there will be a lot of churches that are going to miss out on the first, how can I say, release of it. And God was showing me the churches that are going to miss out on the first release of it. If they even come in. And he said, it's going to be churches that are going to miss it. That are being built by man's ideas. Man's programs. Man's fundraising. Including user-friendly churches. Free grace churches, if even God even calls us a church. Do you follow me? The do-nothings, the entertainment programs. Man trying to recruit people to the church based on what position I can give you or how much I can keep you mentally occupied. Feel good messages. And the Lord said those churches are, and, and then he really addressed competition among the churches. So many churches are competing with each other to see who can have the best program to draw the most people. You have this entertainment system? Well, I'm going to have this entertainment system. You have this program, I'll have, two, I'll have two of them. We're trying to outdo each other to recruit people into the church versus have the anointing draw people to the church. 
when the light comes on us, God's going to bring in the harvest. Do you follow me? And so he says, those churches are not going into the glory. He said, the churches going into the glory are those that are letting the Spirit of God change them, that are living and manifesting the Word of God, that are trusting God in every area of their life. Amen? And here what happened with the disciples. They come to Jesus and they said, who's going to be the greatest? That's the initial trap Satan wants to bring. These are the disciples, not the multitude. These are the disciples. That's the initial trap the enemy wants to bring people into to disqualify them from a move of God. Can I be seen? Can I be heard? Can I be the best? Recognized. And so remember, Jesus said, if you give your alms before men, you have your reward. If you fast before men, you have your reward. If you want the best seat, you have your reward. You want to be seen. And that disqualifies you from the glory of God manifesting in your life. So one of the first things that God does to qualify us for the glory is start to deal with this pride issue within us. To treat, to, to tear out pride where we think we already know everything and we're already there. And produce in us a humility knowing we need God to go where we want to go. Amen. And we become teachable. God can instruct us. We don't think we know everything. I saw a quote the other day. Oh, who, hate, who made this quote? I don't remember. Might have been a puzzle I was doing. And the quote was, yeah, it was a puzzle I was doing. It was a crossword puzzle. It was one of the clues. I'm not young enough to know everything. Do you, do you, do you catch it? So many people that are young think they already know everything. But the older you get to realize how little you do know. Amen. And so I'm not young enough to know everything. And guess what? I don't care how old I get. I'm still going to need God to be my guide, to be my source, right? So they're arguing on who can be the greatest among them. And Jesus called a little child unto him, verse 2, and set him in the midst of them. And said, verily, meaning truly, I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever, shall there, whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this, little, as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now this whole series we've been teaching on is how to enter the kingdom. Right? And he said, to enter the kingdom, Jesus said, you must become as his child. You must humble yourself as his child. Now, jumping back to a dream I had about six weeks ago. I don't want to dream. It was an was encounter with God. God was speaking to me. And uh, he said, if you want to move into the glory of God in the end days, you must learn to live in the kingdom of heaven. We've been so used as charismatics to try to receive out of the kingdom. Oh, God, let me receive healing from you. Oh, God, let me receive prosperity from you. And that's all good. God wants to supply all of our needs, right? But there's a higher level of, of, of spiritual operation where you're not just pulling out of the kingdom. You're living in the kingdom. Now, one of the verses we've gone to, I'm not going to tonight, was out of Deuteronomy chapter 28. Remember the the passage, verses 1 through 14, about the blessings of God. You'll be blessed in the city, blessed in the field. Well, there's some very interesting wording in that passage. In fact, go there so you can see it. Hold this spot. We are going to turn there. Deuteronomy chapter 28. It's where it's always been. It's right after Deuteronomy 27. Verse 1, hopefully I don't hear about that one later. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, 
that the Lord thy God shall set thee on high above all nations of the earth. That's God's promotion system right there. To obey God. Then the same thing about fundraisers, about user-friendly programs. This is just obeying God. He'll set you on high. That's God's promotion system. But then he says this. And all these blessings, say blessings. We've been teaching on the blessings on Sunday morning. All these blessings shall come upon thee and overtake thee if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. It's one level of operation in the kingdom to be able to, by faith, pull out what you need. How many know there's a warfare to do that? You receive a revelation, you say, you, I believe I receive, then the fight's on. But this verse describes a different situation. It didn't say you'll use your faith and fight a strong fight to receive from God. It says these blessings should come upon you and overtake you. That sounds a whole lot better. See, I believe Deuteronomy 28 is pointing to the end times. It's talking about a people that learn to obey and flow with God in everything he's doing. They learn to live in the kingdom of heaven. And now you're not just receiving out of the kingdom. You've moved into it. And now the blessings come on you and overtake you. Now, I know this can sound like a stretch to many people. But I'm telling you, get in the anointing. God will show you what his true plan is. In these end times, he wants to raise up a church that live in the kingdom of heaven. Oh, full time. All the time. They dwell under their own cloud of glory. And as I say all the time, the glory is going to fix everything in your life. Faith becomes automatic in the glory. You believe you receive, and in many levels, you become untouchable by the devil. You know, I believe the Apostle John reached a place he lived in the glory. And tradition says they tried to kill him, and they couldn't. Tried to boil him in oil. Finally, I mean, all the ways they tried to kill him, and they couldn't. Why? The devil couldn't touch him. Finally, all they could do was exile him where he received the revelation and wrote the last book of the Bible. Couldn't stop him. And he was the only apostle of the original 12 that didn't die a martyr's death. He was the only one to die of natural causes. So we can just use, you know, if he punches ticket from old age. Why? And God wants us to be a people that the devil can't touch, that the blessings come on you and overtake you. And it's going to be as we learn to live in this kingdom. Now back to Matthew chapter 18. And I want to read verse 3 again. Verse 3 and 4. And said, Verily I say unto you, Except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, he didn't say this is the way to enter, and he says you will not enter in if you don't. In other words, you can't become someone that develops childlike faith, childlike belief. You can't enter. Now, we've always thought this meant, well, someday when you die, you can't get to heaven. Amen. And I really believe, you know, you get to heaven through being born again, believing in Christ and following, you know, following him. But this childlike thing, I believe, is more applicable to entering the kingdom of heaven now. So here's an example of living in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus, while on earth, lived in the kingdom. He's our example. While he was on earth, he lived in the kingdom. And I believe while he was on earth, until he went to the cross, the devil couldn't touch him. He didn't have depressed days. He didn't have sick days. He didn't call and say, hey, you 12, you take over. I'm, I'm puking too much today. I can't make it. Was never sick. Do you follow me? He took our sickness at the cross, but while he was on earth before the cross, he was never sick a single day. Never broke. Follow me on this. How hard 
Did the baby Jesus have to work his faith for the wise men to bring him all that money? Do you follow me? I mean, everybody knows that when Jesus was delivered the day of his birth, he was already came out walking and talking, right? Casting out devils. He was a little baby. And at his first birthday party, we don't know the exact date, but in that range, Herod wanted to kill all the babies two years old and under. So there's a good chance Jesus was probably about one at the time. And the wise men brought extreme wealth to Jesus as a baby. Could we say all these blessings came upon him and overtook him? Because he was birthed into that kingdom. As he grew up, he became adept at flowing in the kingdom. And again, he's our example of how to live in the glory. And if we can get into the glory like Jesus came into the glory, got, you know, dwelt in the glory, we can have what he had. And all these blessings should come upon you and overtake you. How about on the Mount of Transfiguration? The glory came on us so strong, it changed his countenance and his clothing. After six days. Well, guess what? We're now ending the sixth day prophetically. And it's time for us to go up on the mountain and be transfigured and have the glory of God come on us. Amen. But understand it requires change. So he says, you must be converted and become like a child. Let's read this again. You shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's what we're wanting to do now. Enter now. We're citizens already, but we need to enter. Amen. I want to live there. We're already, we're already receiving from there. God's here tonight. He's already showing us what's in the kingdom. I want to live there. Then he says, verse 3, or verse 4, Whosoever, are you a whosoever? Therefore shall humble himself. You've got to do the humbling. Do you follow me? I never pray God humble me. Amen. I'd rather kind of take over that effort myself. Amen. And that just means you become teachable. You deal with pride issues in your life. You study your life of pride and you deal with it. Amen. Shall humble himself as this little child, the same as greatest in the kingdom of heaven. That's one of those statements that almost seems contradictory. It says you can't enter unless you become like a child. But also, if you do become like a child, you're the greatest. So we're all the greatest. Do you follow me? But you must become humble, meaning instructable, changeable, teachable. Have you ever had conversations with people that were, you couldn't instruct in anything? They always had a counter, counter statement. Well, you know, if you brush your teeth every day, it'll stop tooth decay. Yeah, well, not in my case. You know, I found it if I just. You know, you know what I'm talking about. There's always a counter response. Well, not for me. It doesn't apply. And those are people. That are going to have difficulty entering the kingdom. Especially when a pastor says to them, their pastor says, you know, you really need to make an adjustment. here." Well, you know, who are you to tell me that? Well, there's, there's, a, there's a blockage there. But the neat thing with kids is you can tell them anything and they'll believe it. If you tell a child there are 47 billion stars in the sky and three, they'll quote that number. Because their teacher said it or their parents said it or an adult said it, they'll believe it. I mean, you can tell them, you can tell them that, that horses have 12 stomachs. They'll believe it. They don't. But you said it. It becomes a fact to them. And you can tell a child anything, and they'll believe it, except if you tell them that's wet paint. Then they have to test it. I've told this story before, probably been a long time ago, but I remember when I was, oh, six years old or so, five or six, uh, there were a bunch of neighbor kids that I played with. 
And uh, I went over to see a bunch of them, and they were sitting on the ground. And one of the ones that was a couple years older had this beach ball in her lap. And it was a girl, and she says, and I'm saying, what are you doing? He says, we're protecting the world. I sat in the next to him. I says, what, what's going on? They said, this beach ball is full of a deadly gas. And if it ever escapes, it'll kill everybody in the world. I believed it. <laughs> really? What are you doing to keep the air in? We're holding our finger on this thing right here. We can't let it out. And I spent some time asking questions like, you know, What's it do to people? Well, they just they shrivel up or die, whatever you do, whatever. And and there were a bunch of people at our house, and my parents were and some other people, some of the parents. And I went in the house, I said, We have an emergency, something like that, you know, we have a problem. They out there have a beach ball full of deadly gas that will kill everybody in the world. And I could not convince them of it. They were not humble whatsoever. Amen. I couldn't convince him. I'm trying to say, Mom, please, you got to do something. Everybody's going to die. They can't hold that thing on the, the finger on the hole forever. Got to go to bed sometime. I worked it out in my mind, you know. I think I, I think I lived that day like the last day of my life. You know? I was working on my whole bucket list when I was six. Because I was a stupid kid but a humble kid that would believe things. And what Jesus was talking about is you got to become somebody that believes that which seems ridiculous to the natural mind. you got to really believe you can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. you got to believe you can cast out devils, you can raise the dead, you can open the eyes, you can cleanse the lepers. you got to believe you can, your faith can do the impossible. You can remove mountains. And that runs so counter to the normal adult mind. Do you follow me? The educated, normal thinking mind. Because we've learned how the five senses, you know, and the laws of physics govern everything in this world. And we can't think of anything operating outside of what we can see, touch, and experience physically. But Jesus says there's another kingdom that if you want to enter into it, you got to believe in its operation like a little child. You've got to believe you have authority in the world. You've got to believe that you, you can use your faith to shift the events in your life. And you've got to believe, here's number one of all, you've got to believe as you spend time seeking God, He's going to shower you with His love and glory. You've got to believe that. Otherwise, you won't. Do it. I was reading a testimony today about a couple that Patty and I know. And the husband's been through some very serious surgeries. And the treatments and surgeries had really set him back physically. That today, the last few days have been a very struggling time for them. Where this man had always been very strong physically and emotionally, was really challenge to keep his joy and so the wife was really struggling and she put online today she said she says you know then I finally realized I was trying to carry the load and not give it to God and now I've given it to God and things are turning around what happened it becomes hard to trust God when the rubber hits the road but if you do watch what he does to move mountains out of the way and God's looking for people that, that will believe in the ridiculous. Now, let me ask you a question. This is an honest question. If I was to stand before the average group of adult people, say in a business meeting or a school gathering or whatever, and I said, the glory of God's coming to the earth and it's going to come upon us. We will shine as lights. And it's going to fix everything in your life. What do you think would be their response to that? How about if I said this? God gives his angels charge over you to bury you up in all your ways. They will, hold, they will carry you up in eagle's wings lest you dash your foot against a stone. So there's, any, there's angels around each of us right now. What would they say? Okay. 
okay. <laughs> but the statements I just made, you believe. What if I stood before the average crowd and I said, listen, if you'll become a tither and give 10% of your increase to the house of God, to your storehouse. And if you do that, God's going to rebuke the devourer and open the windows of heaven over your life. What are they going to say? You're a fool. Of course, that's what the devil says too, right? Think what you could have bought with that. Well, we discovered you can do more with 90% with God's blessing than 100% without it. We believe these things. Yet to the natural adult mind, they sound ridiculous. You know what that means? You've already become somewhat childlike. Now, how much more childlike can you become? Now, listen, you're going to be a smart child, not a stupid child. You're not going to listen to a bunch of kids telling you they're about to destroy the world. But you will become childlike to the word of God. Childlike to the prophecies of the end times. Childlike to God's blessings and promises out of the word of God. Are you going to say the word says it? That means I can have it. And I believe it. And that seals it. You're going to shift your operation of life from trusting in yourself and your own reasoning abilities and your own saving abilities and your own healing abilities. And you're going to shift it over to trusting God in his kingdom. Again, let's make this clear. Not that you can't go to the doctor's. Not that you can't take out a loan or whatever you need to do, but you're learning to move your reliance into this kingdom. And you always go to this kingdom first. Amen? Why? Because that's where you live. You know, if I have a, if I have a need in my life, say a financial need or a health need, I go to an American doctor or an American financial institution. I'm not riding over to India or what other country, any other country saying, hey, can you give me a loan or can you send me a doctor? Why? Because I live, in, I live in this United States. Well, now I also live primarily in the kingdom of heaven. I'm going there for my needs. So we humble ourselves to become like a child. We become teachable to the word of God. Now, I was teaching this Message, I believe it's a message God gave me about the end times. That if you want to become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven and live there, you must become a master of it. You must develop mastery in the principles that govern the kingdom. So you become a master tither, a master sower, a master speaker, a master forgiver. Amen? You become master at all the principles of the of the kingdom of heaven. Because that's what lets you live there. I don't know how many were at the uh, the homecoming. I called it word route at the homecoming. But I called up three experts in their fields. An engineer, electrical engineer, a doctor, and, and, and probably the most knowledgeable person about engines I've ever met. As far as the details and the tolerances. His mind just lives there. And I started asking them questions about their specific field of expertise. And as they described what they do, I realized I couldn't function in that because I don't have their training and experience. Do you follow me? And if I was in charge of an emergency room and they brought in somebody with bones sticking out of their flesh and, you know, limbs pointing the wrong directions or not breathing or whatever, I wouldn't know what to do. I just know to say, boil some water because that's what they do in the, in the movies. Amen. All the Westerns, they always say, boil the water. That's about the best I can do. Give them an aspirin. Call me in the morning. And people would die because of my lack of expertise if I was in that position. Do you, you follow what I'm talking about? And so, in the same fashion, God's calling us to become masters or experts in functioning in his kingdom. And we know the anointings. We know the flow of the Spirit of God. We hear His voice and obey it clearly. 
You follow me? And promptly. And we become masters of the kingdom. And that lets you live in that kingdom. And so I, I, I read through very quickly some of the aspects of living in the kingdom of heaven. And I want to read through those again tonight and, and probably spend a few more minutes speaking to them. Some of the things that I said those that master the kingdom do not is one, those that master the kingdom are not anxious for services to end. Now listen, I've been in services I was anxious to end. Last Friday night wasn't one of them at Grace, Maine. You follow me? The apostle speaking to us. I, I thought, no, he's finishing already. Keep going. But I remember when I was first saved and I was learning so much about Jesus and the Word and church. And I, was, I was just like a sponge. And I would go to a church and back then we preached a lot longer. You know, we preach usually an hour and a half to two hours. Because that's how long tapes lasted. You could get a 60 minute, a 90 minute, or a 120 minute tape. So we usually went for an hour and a half and stretched a little bit further. And we knew if we get done in two hours, it'd fit on one tape. And I preached all the time for two hours. But then the CDs came out. And CDs are good for 60 minutes, 70 if you stretch it. So what do we do? We shorten our messages. Why well, to get it all on one CD? That just seemed the logical thing to do. Otherwise, you've got the people back there running sound have needing to edit things out. And nothing I ever say is ever worthy of editing out. Well, probably a few things, but but it's one of the people interrupt me. Just kidding. And so I gotta remember where I was going with this whole story. We used to preach for two hours. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. Oh yeah, when I was first saved, they'd preach for two hours and they say, okay, I'm closing. I'd go, no. I'm learning so much. Don't close. This is so good. Preach all night. And I meant it. I wanted them to go on and on and on. And I would go to conferences and they'd shut down a message after an hour, an hour and a half. No, keep going. Let's worship God, do another song. Then I reached a place where I'd learned a lot of what they were teaching. A lot of it was review. A lot of it was stuff, maybe even some of it was boring. You know, maybe they'd gotten off track. And I'm like, is, are they ever going to shut up? Are they going to do? An, are they going to advertise another book? You know. Anyway, and I'm ready for this one to end. And not saying that doesn't happen now. Hopefully not right now to you guys. And 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 God's challenged me on that in the past. Say, this is my word. Why would you be in a hurry for it to end? This word's changing you. Do you think you're already there? And so those that are always want the services to, to end have missed it somewhere where they're after just doing their duty versus being changed. Well, you know, my show is on TV. What part of that show are you going to take into heaven with you? We get our priorities mixed up, right? And I don't know about you, but I've been challenged before. Have you left your first love? Hopefully the answer is no, but I, I want to make sure I ask myself that. Because I always want to be pressing into more of the kingdom of heaven. Another area where people tend to disqualify or limit themselves from the kingdom is they're always upset over tithing or offering. They've taken up another offering. You don't understand the kingdom. If you have a problem with tithing, you do not understand the kingdom, how it operates. Or sowing seed. If we really knew how the kingdom functioned, we'd be thrilled at the opportunity to sow. Amen. And trust God to speak to us about it. And third, worried about the flow of services. We might have caused some problems for somebody tonight, just in the flow we had before we started taping. We start off calling people up for healing. Just following the Spirit of God, seeing what He's going to do. And some people want a traditional, scheduled service always going the same. 
And did you hear that they gave a prophecy in church? Is that a prophecy? Can you do that? You know, the other night, we had that, that individual that gave that tongue, and there was no interpretation. But it was an intercessory tongue. It wasn't an interpret interpretable tongue. As far as, you know, normal service. and You can't get frustrated over that. You can ask what's going on, but don't let it bother you. Just trust God with the service. Don't worry about the flow. God's in charge. He'll handle it. He's taking us into the glory if we're just teachable. But we've got to be careful. These critical spirits want to come in and have us second-guessing what's going on. And, of course, make room for your leaders to miss it as well. And someday when I do, hope you'll have mercy on me. Just teasing. This isn't pride. This is keeping your attention. Do you follow me? It's my form of humor. I could talk about these biceps. What are you laughing at? So how do we develop mastery to live in God's kingdom? What are some of the things we need to do to develop this mastery? First of all, make sure you're always aware that you're in the kingdom, that you're a citizen. Place a demand on the anointing. Always be aware God's with you now. Amen? You don't just experience God when you're at church. You can experience him all the time and place a demand on that. God, go with me right now. Lead me right now. Speak to me right now. A person that's really working to develop mastery in God's kingdom is consistently endeavoring to use their faith and to apply faith principles. I mean, here's a, here's a question, and I don't mean this to be condemning, but it's this, these questions are to, are to, how can I say, initiate self-analysis. You know what I mean by that? I'm not going to give you a test. These are self-analytical self questions to let you know maybe where you stand in some things. So here's my question. What have you used your faith for today already? Have you used your faith today? And I believe every one of you probably have. I know Tammy's been using her faith. And, and China and Connie, hey, you feel bad. You're going to use your faith if you're a Holy Ghost Christian. BJ got healed before she got in here by her faith. But it's just not just for, you don't have to be sick to use your faith. I'm calling in money every day. I'm decreeing the blessing of God on myself every day. I'm declaring the glory of God on myself every day. Do you follow me? I'm, I'm in, I, I declare I'm in love and in the glory every day. And there will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I, you know, I've been in the Word a few times today, several times actually. And every time I open the Bible, I say, God, give me a revelation out of this book. Don't let me fall prey to just religious, ritualistic reading. Let me believe I receive messages out of it. You're going to speak to me in this. What is it, using your faith? Father, bless my wife. Save my family. Minister to my children. Using your faith. And you learn to live in that realm of always extending your faith to see supernatural results. You know, I've been working on vehicles the last couple of days. Well, one vehicle, well, two of them, I guess. Taking one apart and putting one together. And when you're working on old vehicles, bolts tend to be rusty. And I've taken off some big bolts here lately. And I'm repeatedly saying, God, loosen this bolt. But an angel deal with this and there was a couple of them that I had to get out I, I could not really it would have been really bad news had they broken because I'm using a bar this long big sockets and I'm pulling and they're pretty good sized bolts but you can snap them if this bolt snaps I've got a mess and I would stop and say God loosen that bolt Give me wisdom to get the bolt out. And there it would happen. There would be some bolts. Seemed like it wasn't going to come. Comes free. And so I didn't snap a single bolt the last two days. Everything's come free. Everything's worked. But I didn't do much today. Mostly yesterday. Today was word and prayer. 
that you're using your faith. Father, give me wisdom in this job. Give me ideas of witty solutions. Show me shortcuts to do things, get things done. How can I be a blessing today? What do you do? You're getting your faith out there. And you're exercising your ability to hear God. You're creating a two-way communication flow. That you're asking for God to help you, but you're wanting to hear him in the process to know how to do it, how to apply what he tells you. What's happening? You're learning to live in that kingdom. And if we only use our faith when we get in trouble, we're sick or broke or something's in strife, something's in, oh God, I pray your help. Well, then we're really, again, I'm not trying to condemn anybody. We really have not made the shift to learn to live in the kingdom. A major shift is becoming a faith person, not an occasional faith user. Amen. I mean, every time I get on the motorcycle, I make I, I can't say I'm a hundred percent, but I'm in the nineties. Every time I get on the motorcycle, I get on the motorcycle, Father, your angels ride with me. You ride with me right now. Amen. And I'll have no close calls. I have no animals come out in front of me. No problems whatsoever. In the name of Jesus. And here we go. Now I've used my faith to release God. To support me. To sustain me. Right? We're learning to live in the kingdom of heaven. I mentioned it already, but... Somebody that's developing mastery trusts first in the kingdom before they go to anything else. See, let me give you an example of this. If someone only ever calls upon God as a last resort, they're not developing mastery. Here's an example. I'll just give you a made-up example, but I was talking about taking out bolts. I have some things that help me take out bolts. I've got, you know, liquid wrenches, PB blaster, big wrenches and sockets. I got, I got a torch. Heat solves a whole lot of problems sometimes if you can use heat. And, of course, these massive biceps. And pipes to put on socket wrenches to give more leverage, whatever. I, hey, and I know also, here's a, here's, a, here's, a, here's a helper. If you're taking out a bolt and it's rusted up as you're taking it out, pull it as far as you can without breaking it. Spray it full of WD-40 or liquid wrench or whatever and screw it back in. And it puts the liquid on the threads. Then pull it out again a little further, spray some more, screw it back in again. By working it back and forth, you're lubricating those threads again, and all of a sudden you'll find it comes right out. Plus, I got impact drivers. <laughs> oh, those are fun. And so I have a tight bolt. This is an example, you know, made up example. I have a tight bolt. So what do I do? I get a bigger wrench. Still not coming free. I may break it if I'm not careful. What do I do? I get the liquid wrench. The PB blaster. Try that. Doesn't help. I try moving it back and forth. Doesn't help. Get the torch. Doesn't help. Finally, having exhausted every tool and lubricant and other method I have, I finally say, God, I can't get this. I need your help. Last resort. Is not a person that's really learned to live in the kingdom. Person learning to live in the kingdom says, God, I'm about to take that bolt out. I know it may be rusty, but I know you got angels to help me. Have them de-rust that thing right now. You know, an angel could take his fingernail and go around that thread and just clean it right out for you if he wants to. Using the lubricant, let this lubricant get right where it needs to go. And Father, I think this bolt does not break. It comes out. And watch what God does. And 
whether you think God helped you or not. Whether you think it was your great tools or great wisdom did it. At least God get God invited to help you in the process as you go and you're learning to live in that kingdom. Well, God, I need to bake a cake. Help me with this cake. Get God involved in it. I'm going to do laundry. Here's Patty's been praying. Lord, let this washing machine work this time. We bought a really expensive washing machine five or six years ago, maybe longer. A Bosch, top of the line. When it's running next to it, it's so quiet you couldn't even really hear it. And because uh, I like Bosch tools. And that washing machine's been the biggest piece of junk we have ever bought. I've worked on it more times than Carter's got little liver pills. I mean, all the time, something malfunctioning. And usually it wouldn't put enough water in it if it put any water in it. And I knew I could probably work on it some more. But she'd fussed about it enough. I, I called her and said, Patty, we're going to get a new washing machine today. Went and got a new washing machine. I took that. I didn't even put it works on this. I just said, we're junking this thing. I carried it out the side of the road. Within 15 minutes, there was a guy there to drive it through to pick it up. I took great pleasure throwing it on a truck and watching it break into pieces and shred. See if I get out of my house. Rebellious <laughs> washing machine. How did I get over there? It, she prayed over that washing machine. And I think she finally quit praying. I think she finally quit praying. God fix it. She says, God, have Jack get me a new one. You learn to use your faith and invite God into everything that you're doing. Amen? You trust the kingdom first. I was talking to a lady in Illinois a couple of weeks ago. We were there. And she had lost a whole lot of weight. Not that she was ever excessively heavy, but, you know, she's our age. And you tend to put on a few pounds. Well, she'd really trim down. And I says, what did you do? How did you lose that weight? And she says, I got tired of trying to do it myself and ask God to help me. And she said, God told me, he says, if I'll work on my portion size, he'll do the rest. Do you know how much weight she dropped? Well, I won't say the name on the thing. I bet she dropped 50 pounds, if not more. Illinois, Pastor Bob's church. Anyway, we trust first in the kingdom. She finally gave it to God. Another thing we do if we want to be in time, people live in the, in the kingdom, we live in a state of worship. You shut the heathen music on, you put on the God music, you worship God. You know, I didn't know I could listen to the same Phil Driscoll album so many times in a row. But it always sounds wonderful because it's anointed. You follow me in Jesus culture and whatever you like to listen to, put it on and worship God all the time. And especially when you don't feel like worshiping God. Really put it on. Turn it up. Do you, make your up your own dance. Whatever you got to do. Because as we worship him, he inhabits our praises. And as he inhabits your praises, you are now positioning yourself to live in the kingdom. Because you're experiencing the same atmosphere of heaven itself. We become people of worship. And then as well, we pray without ceasing. Again, here's a, here's a, here's a couple self-examination, self-analysis question I could ask. When's the last time you praise God, not at church? I know it doesn't apply to you guys. You worship God all the time. For those watching by CD, when's the last time you praise God and it wasn't at church? You worship God, wasn't at church? Well, if that's the only time you worship God is in a service, you're probably not positioning yourself to live in the kingdom. Amen. And then to pray without ceasing. 
I pray nearly without ceasing. If I'm not focused on something else, I'm praying all the time in the Spirit. I mean, if I'm at the house working on something, boy, I buy a sundial. If I'm shopping, boy, I buy a sundial. It becomes almost, not almost, it becomes first nature to you. Not second nature, first nature. That you're always praying in the Spirit. And when you do, of course, you're praying the, the, the perfect will of God, you're praying mysteries unto God. It comes back as revelation. You're charging your spiritual batteries up in the Holy Ghost. And it enables you to live in the kingdom. And I'm not, I'm not sure in these end times. Now here I may make somebody mad. But I'm not sure you can even live in the kingdom of God in these end times. Unless you pray in the Holy Ghost. Unless you pray in tongues. It helps you make the transition into that realm. Amen. And it enables you to pray what you don't even know to pray. And what you may not know is God needs you in that kingdom. You need to be in that kingdom. And you're praying, God, get me in the kingdom. Help me to transition there. So you, you, you practice praying in the Spirit so much, you do it all the time. Amen? So a self-analysis question could be, how much have you prayed in the Spirit today? Or yesterday, when you weren't at church, through your day? Well, my job, I just can't do that. Well, unless you're a, unless you're a public speaker all day, you probably can. Because I can mumble in tongues and nobody can hear it. But I'm praying. And I'm God alert and God aware. Amen. Qualifying you to live in that kingdom realm. As well, this one's a little more difficult. You speak the word only. Now by that I don't mean you only speak scriptures. What I mean is you only speak things that agree with Scripture. You don't speak things that disagree with Scripture. Well, I've just been sick all day. I'm sick right now. Well, that's not speaking the word only. I'm broke, been broke, going to be broke tomorrow too. That's not Scripture. You're not speaking the word only. And a person, <laughs> how many people in heaven right now that have died and gone to heaven, how many people are there you, do you think are talking about how sick they are? How broke they are. How lonely they are. How depressed they are. How fearful they are. They're not. Why? Because none of that's in heaven. And as long as we're speaking it down here, we're restricting our access to living in the kingdom of heaven now. Why do you want to claim that stuff anyway? When you start claiming fear and sickness and lack, you're opening doors for the devil to come in and attack you in those areas. Well, I'm always broke. Well, a devil hears that and says, yeah, and I'm going to help you with that right now. Thank you for the permission. I'm about to steal something else from you. Nothing ever goes right for me. That's like an open floodgate to the demonic to attack your life. So a person that's learning to master the kingdom monitors everything that comes out of their mouth. And they have such a life of connection with God. As it starts to go out, you capture it and you say, no, you can't go out. Words, you come back here. And you speak what the word says. I'm healed. I'm blessed. I'm joyful. I'm filled. I'm prosperous. I shall live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. You know, I lost one of my brothers. It'll be a year ago next week, August 2nd. My youngest brother died of a brain bleed. Wouldn't take his blood pressure medicine they tried to give him. And uh, a year and a half ago, my middle brother, I'm the oldest, was diagnosed with a cancerous tumor on his kidney the size of an orange. So they took his kidney. And he bloated up so big at one time, what did they take? 30-something units of fluid out of him? 
I mean, it was just a massive amount. He said he was asking God to take his life. He was in such misery. And I would call him to pray with him. And, I was, and he's, he's not even going to church, you know. If you ask him, he says he's saved, you know. Uh, I want to witness to him some more. but uh, So he has a better understanding. But he believes in God. But God did something inside of him during that time, at the outset of it. I would call him and I'd say, how are you, Keith? he said, say, I'm in my prime. And that's all he would say is, I'm in my prime. The whole time, he go to the doctor. Doctors say, you know, you better go home and make your plans. They told him, they told him go home and get your affairs in order. Basically, you're going to die from all the effects of that surgery. What happened? They took the one kidney. And because he had been drinking so many years, the other kidney was shutting down. And his liver was affected. He needed a liver transplant, all these things. And they, they sing, you're going to die. And he says, I'm in my prime. That's all he would say. And he saw a total recovery. Well, then here a few weeks ago, he called me and said, they found cancer in my body. Again, it's all through my body. It's in my lungs, my liver, pancreas, all through my body. But because he'd had the other cancer surgery, they found it was very small. And he went to the doctor, and the, and the doctor was going to tell him the results. And the doctor says, how are you? And he says, I'm in my prime. He says, well, you got cancer. <laughs> and it turns out there's some new pill they're giving him, some new treatment. They say it will never cause you a problem. You caught it at the right time. It's so small, it'll never grow beyond that. And uh, praise God. He's in his prime. I'm talking about the power of what you say. Speak the word only. You remember the centurion sent the man to Jesus because his servant needed to be healed? And Jesus said, I will come to his house and I will pray for him. And the, and the centurion said word and says, no, I'm not worthy. You should even come to my house. But speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. And Jesus said, I've not found greater faith, no, not in all of Israel. Speak the word only. And refuse for words to come out of your mouth that curse your life, curse your possessions, curse your relationships, curse your family. Follow me? Curse your finances. Whatever. Refuse it. Don't open that door. And you start to transition into the realm of living in the kingdom of heaven. Hang on one second. Well, listen. We'll continue this next week. Amen. And uh, I believe this is the message God's going to have us on for a while. How to live in the kingdom and how to live in the blessing Sunday mornings, right? Well, I want to remind you as well, August 4th, Sunday, Sunday night is our first community ambassadors meeting. So I'm asking everyone to make it Sunday night, August 4th. Put that in your calendars. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask you, Lord God, to seal it within us. I speak in this church, there are none sick, none in a lack, none in fear, none oppressed. None anxious in any area. Thank you. The blessing overtakes each member. The blessings overtake us from every direction. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need prayer for anything, I would be.